hello uh, once again um, for those of you who are here yesterday. And if you weren't here yesterday, hello for the very first time. My name is uh, Andrew Tuck. I'm the editor in chief of Monocle magazine. And as I explained yesterday, we've had a, a very nice association with the people at camp and with Prague across the year. So I'm delighted to be allowed to moderate again the sessions this afternoon. In a few minutes, I get to explain a little bit about Monocle's take on urbanism and why we're so keen to be part of this really important conversation that so many of you are players in, and hopefully why we have a slightly different perspective to some people as well. But this isn't a, a, a process just with me asking questions. It's, we're really keen for everybody to get involved in this. So uh, you, if you go to slido.com on your phones, or for people who are watching the live stream, if you go to slido.com, you just have to put hashtag summit of the cities, and you're able to ask questions. And then I get given an iPad later on with the, the questions rolling up. And it was uh, great yesterday to have those, that participation. So I really encourage everybody to get involved with that as well. But first of all, to um, welcome us here to Prague and to the city, uh, to camp as well, I'd like to um, welcome to the stage your mayor, Zdeněk Hezib. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you again here in the center of architecture and metropolitan planning for the last part of the Prague Summit of Cities. We had uh, already a very fruitful two days of discussions amongst the representatives of 25 cities from Europe and beyond. Yesterday, on the platform of the Pact of Free Cities, we've discussed the Russian war in Ukraine, its implications to our cities and the ways how our cities could help Ukrainian cities, and we had the privilege to uh, having of having the mayor of Kiev with Mr. Vitaly Klitschko here with us the whole day, and I think that his insights were very useful. And we had also Mayor of Mykolaiv, Mr. Oleksandr Senkevich, who shared his experience with us online. Unfortunately, uh, well, you have probably noticed he had to. Uh, log out from the session and unfortunately we received the message that the reason why he had logged out was that there was a warning of yet another attack on his city which was indeed followed by shelling then so Mayor uh, Senkevich had to rush to a shelter and I believe that this is very gloomy and it illustrates the real example of how serious is the danger in Ukraine uh, that the cities have to face? Well, earlier on today, then on the second day, I had the privilege of hosting the direct dialogue between the EU capitalist mayors and the representatives of the European Commission. So we had the executive vice president of the European Commission, Mr. Franz Timmermans here, and I have to say it was a very stimulating debate because apart from hearing a lot of examples and commitments from my colleagues, I was very pleased to see a recognition from the level of the European Commission of absolutely crucial role of the cities, which was uh, told us by Mr. Timmermans. And in now, in the following two hours, my colleagues from Helsinki and Barcelona, Brussels, Vilnius and Berlin will talk about what their cities are doing for improving the quality of life of their citizens. So please enjoy the panel and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for that great welcome. And, and again, it's really interesting being allowed to sit in on, on the conversations this morning. And as we've heard, we, we've talked about Ukraine, we've talked about the energy crisis. But I'm hoping that over the next uh, sessions, we'll also get to hear about some of the, the softer sides of city living and things that mayors are doing to change their cities for the better. Not, 
we want to broaden the conversation a little bit as we, we go on this afternoon. So there'll be some softer moments as well, I promise. It's not all going to be <laughs> tough news. And also, what was great about the sessions this morning was actually in crisis, how many people are, in, are finding inspiring things to, to do as well? So even in these moments, a, a moment of real change, people are thinking, actually, this is the time that we can go faster, not slower, for change to do with environmental issues, how we treat our buildings, how we add solar panels to rooftops. Suddenly, maybe these things can be done quicker. So nobody wanted this moment, but potentially we have a moment of opportunity here as well. But first of all, uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage the, the head of camp, uh, and that is uh, Stepan Bartel. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm very happy that you made it here to, to camp, uh, which is coincidentally the topic of my presentation in the beginning. Uh, basically, I want to talk about, I'm not an architect, but I am surrounded by uh, amazing uh, urban planners, designers, architects, and uh, it's our great honor to at least attempt to translate what they do uh, in, for the general public so it's as accessible as, as, uh, as possible. So I'm going to start with a picture. This is Richard. He's a silverback gorilla in the Prague Zoo. And we are, he's kind of a celebrity in Prague, and we're kind of envious because for him and for the Prague Zoo as well, because it's extremely easy from a media perspective to, when you have that sort of content, to actually get it across to people. But uh, in contrast, this morning I googled urban planner into stock photos, and this is what came out. So you have hard hats, you have different you know, tools, you have a blueprint, you have a lot of people talking, a dialogue. It's not, as you can see, it's not as easy to sell, quote unquote, uh, as that. And uh, how we approach, we try to approach the, the urban planning uh, in a way that is accessible to, to everyone. And I, I have to thank uh, the Prague Institute of Planning and Development, of which uh, I'm an extremely proud member, and, and, and the colleagues that are doing a great job uh, since 2013 when, when this uh, institute was uh, founded. And basically, uh, just to run through uh, what we do, it's thinking about long term. So Prague in 2030, 2040, 2050. But it's also kind of finding places within the city, so brownfields, which could become livable neighborhoods. Uh, some, you know, looking for places which could be host to high rises, but also how to stop suburbanization and other things that go hand to hand with, hand in hand with city living. And on the sort of micro scale, it's urban design, designing great squares, streets and parks. So, but from my perspective, it's also a great emphasis on communication and basically being able to explain what we do. Uh, so this was our very first event, probably inspired by something we read in the monocle that we should do like a neighborhood party or something. And uh, yeah, this is the amount of people that came to the first event. And uh, by the way, we, we spent so much time talking about what we're going to do the discussion, discussion on that we forgot to invite people. But uh, so we, we, we learned slowly, uh, but for the fir for, for five uh, subsequent, uh, for five Fridays in a row, or five Saturdays, I mean, we closed down one street, one embankment of Prague, uh, quite close to the National Theatre. And what happened is some people had fun, some people danced around. A lot of people got angry because the other embankment, the other street, the other part of Prague, got completely full of cars. There was a huge traffic jam. So media-wise, it was great. W were people happy? Not so sure. Uh, so we started doing smaller things, uh, walking around, describing neighborhoods, uh, talking uh, with politicians uh, and other uh, officials. Uh, sometimes, see, we already had more people. They even came in the rain. That was fun. This is a brownfield where we had a movie screening. Uh, this is a similar, this is a former parking lot right directly in the heart of Prague, which is, it's not a, was a parking lot. It's a nice square now, outside exhibition. And for me personally, the, the, the biggest marker of getting more professional was the founding of the participation office because 10 or even seven years ago, uh, this, now you say, of course you ask the people, you know, what their opinion is before you start building something. But uh, only with, with this, which uh, 
started seven years ago here. Uh, I think we actually moved to, to a phase of becoming, becoming a, a, a city with a higher quality of life. And now every project is done this way. But uh, over the course, we, we knew that we needed a physical space, and here we are. Camp, is, this is the place we're sitting at right now. This is not 1970s, this is 2014. This is halfway through, and this is where, uh, when it was finished. And I think a lot of the reason why it works so well is that we have this, we call it our little architectural IMAX, but uh, having 24 meters and having this as an empty space, or in this case, having full of inspiring people, is amazing. And this allowed us, for example, see you have this black box on one side, a very friendly part on the other side. So within one day, you can have a party, and a presidential, sorry, and a presidential debate. Anyway, uh, I want to talk about a couple of projects that we did. Uh, Prague Tomorrow was the oldest, oldest one that we did. Uh, it was a simple project. You asked the developers in Prague, we asked all of the developers in Prague, what are you building, where, how much is it going to cost, what is it going to look like, and when will it be finished? Five simple things. And Half of them kind of laughed at us, but we invited all of them to the exhibition opening, and uh, it was really actually really funny to, to see because if your biggest competitor in the real estate has this project here on the big wall and you don't, yeah, that gets pretty competitive. So next day we got another 30 projects, and it's, uh, it's basically we're mapping uh, and trying to come up with the most overwhelming database of construction projects, both city and private, in, in the city of Prague. If I could ask uh, to play a video, this is basically, we had another task to have a strategic plan. It was 3,000 pages of a document and make it into a game. There was, was Our goal was to entertain visitors in a tangible and comprehensive way. What would Prague look like if planning was in the hands of the people? We created a space for the exhibition visitors to play with original animated illustrations of Prague. On a giant 24-meter projection screen, people took control of urban development, transportation, cultural offerings, and even citizens' well-being. We wanted to create something understandable across all generations. That's why we combined digital technologies with mechanical ones. Each station had its own analog control. By motion of the colored cubes at the gaming table or suspension rods, you influenced the look of the city and triggered animations onto the projection screen. Visitors could literally take planning into their own hands. Along with that, we created a graphic bank of stylized pictograms that could be used for data visualizations and graphs. The exhibition contains several levels of informativeness, from the interactive canvas through the graphics of the exhibition space to detailed brochures. So yeah, that was Imagine Prague, an exhibition that we did. And this is our uh, a project that uh, is from this year. Uh, Prague Institute of Planning and Development hosted uh, a major architectural competition for the new Voltava Philharmonic Concert Hall, which was uh, won uh, by big BRK Ingels Group, uh, and we had a, a, a big exhibition here over the summer. So, but in a way, we had to go back to the street because we created this little social bubble that, you know, all the hipsters went to, and we thought we might actually go uh, into other places in Prague. And what better way to do it than with a new master plan, the land use plan? So this was um, basically a you know, normal naval container, which we took around 57 uh, city districts and had very interesting conversations about what we're doing right and wrong and how well we're liked or disliked. Um, yeah. We also got our own architectural tram, which some of you might have come in this, this uh, fine day or yesterday maybe, uh, and started just kind of working with other modes of transportation, a lot of uh, urban uh, or sites, like bike, bike uh, rides with people as well with boat rides, it was always fun. And uh, because we wanted to make this place a very friendly and, and livable place, We've always been working on making the, 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 the places around camp and IPR 
much more livable. So it's a park, it's, uh, it's a summer cinema, and a lot of other things. Uh, then came COVID. I'm going to go very quickly through COVID phase because we all wanted it to end very quickly, but it didn't. So this is our moderator with no people. He was very sad because I'm yeah, basically, we also came up with a, a magazine. So basically our moderator became a podcast moderator. Our uh, people that work in the cafe, they became our editors or magazine. And uh, that was uh, really fun for a while. But then we realized that we needed to see other people and travel. So we had this project called the Virtual City Tour with all uh, with different architectural organizations around the world, where we basically uh, pretended that we're traveling and then uh, had all these guests. And it was a super fun way to, to pass time. And, and make a little bucket list of places we wanted to go. And finally, uh, I know that we're talking about livable cities, and when we're talking about livable cities, we often <laughs> talk about public transport and, and, and uh, having parks and streets and squares, but uh, I think it goes, of course, above and beyond, and um, I, I just want to thank again uh, our mayor, Mr. Zdenia Grzyb, for organizing the, the, the summit, because uh, these are the questions that we are talking about, but there's also much more fundamental, important questions, such as the ones that we talked about yesterday with Mr. Klitschko and uh, everyone else. So I would like to uh, thank you again for coming to camp and uh, enjoy the rest of this summit. Thank you very much. I'm not going to let him get off that easily. I, no, we're going to talk about, uh, in a minute, we're going to talk some deputy mayors and mayors and leaders of their cities. And I'm, we're going to ask them, a, we've asked them a simple question to set the day up, which is to say, what's one thing in your city that's a success? And what's one thing that, not a failure, is a, a challenge that's on your to-do list? Um, whether you've got your camp hat on, as it were, or not, what for you, when you think about Prague, what do you think is the the challenge for Prague, and what do you think the thing is that's a, a nice big tick in the the done list for Prague? I'm going to start with the uh, with the success, or maybe rather, uh, I think the biggest benefit of Prague is it's transportation, it's public transportation. Actually, you can get anywhere all the time, and it's super cheap and super accessible. And I think uh, the amount of people actually using public transportation in Prague is incredible. We always talk about Amsterdam and Copenhagen and Vienna. Actually, Prague is really, really, uh, you know, topping these cities in that, in that regard. The challenge, I think, is still being able to, you know, kind of dig this up. There, there's still a big uh, gap between the public and the developers, public and politicians. Uh, and even when we stay in the you know, modes of transportation, I drive a car, I drive a bike, and I walk, and whenever I'm in this different role, I, I change completely, and there's not a lot of respect between them. So I think lack of respect is a thing to, to drop, adopt, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, public transportation, that's the best thing we have. Well, we, we, me and Carlotta, who's come here from Monocle, with, we've been everywhere on the tram. Yeah. And I'd like that architecture tram for Monocle. So could you, when you finish with it, can we have a big Monocle written on the side of that tram, please? Yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you how much it costs afterwards. Uh, Stefan Bartel, thank you so, thank much, you so uh, much for joining us. Well, as I said, we, we, we've asked everyone to come up here with something that's working and something that's a challenge. Um, I'm told that some of the, the people being invited up here have gone a little bit freestyle. Instead of having one thing, they've got 10 things, but we've, we've tried to whittle it down. We're going to start uh, in Helsinki with the, the deputy mayor of Helsinki, with uh, Uni uh, Sinemaki, if you'd like to come and join us here on the stage. And just before you start, you know, we, we, we heard a little bit uh, uh, away from here this morning, you, you're talking about some of the, the big challenges. Uh, for you, when you come here representing Helsinki, is it as a representative of a city that's a pioneering change, do you think? Well, yes, in a way, but also I feel when I listen to others, I feel the things that we can learn. Uh, so I... I really feel it's mutual. Uh, I think Helsinki has things to give, but I also feel that I'm like thirsty uh, hearing things that we could uh, learn from. Well, Annie, I'm going to step on stage and you can talk us through the <laughs> images that you've chosen to show us the, the, the positives and the challenges that remain for Helsinki. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, great to be here. I was thinking, is Mr. Martin Bursik still here? Um, he's the only person, I think, who knows the longest sentence I know in Czech. Uh, that is a quote from Milan Kundera. Nalejmi ještě slivovice řekla Klara a já jsem nebyl protiv. Uh, and um, <laughs> which could be a hint what I would like to have afterwards. A thing that um, we would drop in Helsinki or that we will actually get rid of in Helsinki is coal. And uh, you can see it in the pictures, uh, a pile of coal that we still at this day have in the very really near the city center of Helsinki. And for me, I think Helsinki is a progressive city in many ways. Uh, we have good quality education, ambitious climate goal, reducing emissions by 80% uh, from 1990 level. But it tells, I think for me, and it tells us that the change so far in the world has been too slow since we still see these power plants around us. But what gives me hope is that it's actually by the end of March next year that this power plant will stop its operations. Uh, it's been a long journey. We have done investment to replace this power plant uh, since the ninth, uh, 2015 when we made the decision to close it down and it has demanded uh, discussion, uh, investment in heat pumps that we take uh, heat out of wastewater, uh, investment in storages um, that uh, storage the heat, uh, also uh, biomass investment we have done partly to replace it. So it's been a long journey, it has cost us money and it's not been easy, but now we are really closing to having a change of an era. And I visited the power plant um, like three weeks ago, a month ago perhaps, and um, we were guided by the guy who runs its operations. It's an impressive place. Um, it's one year younger than I am myself. It, was, uh, it started its functions in 1974. And actually the machinery inside the plant is quite much from the 70s. Of course, it's been repaired and some of it renewed, but you really have some Skoda uh, turbines and uh, you even have like metal balls that are size of the football that uh, where the coal that comes from the pile, it goes to a place where it's been pushed into coal dust and it's the dust that is burned uh, in the end. And I talked with the guy who has been running it for, for a long time and uh, we were there, it's, it has beautiful big um, rooms since, well, it's a factory, so the roof is high. And I said that it's a spectacular place and these premises are beautiful. And he said that, yeah, it's a spectacular place, but it's uh, time for it to go. And I thought that it was really beautiful that even someone who has had his professional pride in running this facility uh, now sees and thinks that it's time to say goodbye to coal. Then, um, the thing that uh, we are keeping or that we are proud of, uh, these pictures are from projects uh, that uh, people of Helsinki proposed, voted upon, and that the city uh, then executed together with those people who did the proposals. Uh, since last uh, council period, we have had this thing of participatory budgeting, uh, which uh, has, uh, is um, every second year, 8 million euros budget for citizens' proposals that are, um, they are um, 
done so that you have part of the city that is your area and you propose projects, uh, you discuss them, you campaign for them, then people, everyone who has been turned 12 years can vote. So it's younger people than in the, in the normal elections. Uh, they can vote and then those uh, who have got the best amount of votes and that fit into the 8 million budget, they get to be executed by the city and also discussed and developed uh, about the actual way of execution. Uh, you have an outdoor uh, gym. You have a, in the middle, uh, there's a recreational island that we have fought a long time, whether it should be developed and built or stayed as a recreational island. Now it's decided it will stay as a recreational island. And this is um, an electric boat that goes back and forth. Uh, the island is only like 150 meters from the mainland. So that's why the boat can be so small. And the last one, um, it's a pier uh, for swimming and it's applicable also during the winter. So people of that area, uh, they just keep the uh, hole in the ice when the sea uh, uh, has, has the ice coverage. Uh, so they can use the pier and walk there uh, to have winter swimming. As a professional politician, it has been super interesting to follow that. Uh, how people campaign, how even people in the neighborhoods get into bitter fights <laughs> over the projects uh, which uh, will be executed. Um, it's also been a learning process for people of this city to see how things are not as cheap as they first thought. Uh, the estimation of the budget has been different when it's uh, um, uh, when it's uh, their own estimation or when it's really done in the project form. But it's certainly something that has taught us as a city administration a lot about what uh, people are interested in. It has created really good discussions and actually also those proposals and projects that have not been voted to be the winners, winners we do take them into account when we perhaps have some changes in the street plans or in the park plans. Um, and I think that it's been also a really good attitude changer to the city administration to see how we have to work together because people of Helsinki do not see the administrative differences within the city that are quite significant sometimes within the city administration. So a learning uh, process plus really nice new places in Helsinki. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, well, well, we're going to actually pass on the baton actually to, uh, to Brussels now. So a, a huge thank you to uh, Uni there for, for joining us. But now we're going to uh, cross to um, Brussels and uh, Anna Pearsons, who's going to talk a little bit about your city and some of the, the challenges that you, you've faced as well. And you've got the clicker and everything. You're, uh, you're super or I organized. I don't need a clicker. I just need a green light, but I will already try. Yeah, That's like the that green light. Because, uh, Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Anne Persons. I'm a deputy mayor in Brussels, and I'm in charge of urban planning and, planning and public space. I have to say my presentation is a bit more chaotic than the one of Helsinki. But I'm trying to, I will try to be, um, to talk to you about some different, very concrete things that we're doing in Brussels. Uh, things that are going well and things I think we could do better. Uh, first of all, I wanted to show you, I have to see where it is. This is, we, as many streets in, in, in Europe, we're uh, creating much more car-free zones. And it started with the historical streets around the, the Grand Place, our main square, but at one point, this was a main axe uh, in, in Brussels that, and I've been talking to, to a lot of people here, and some of you know Brussels quite well. This was a two by, there were four lanes of cars, and it was a major axe in the city, uh, cutting the city in two. And uh, like it, we decided to make the entire um, very large car street car free. And now it is uh, a big success. Uh, if you 
go to walk through Brussels now, you can't imagine that a few years ago there were still uh, only cars because there are so many people that you can't imagine that at one point they were just pushed, pushed together uh, on the sidewalks. Um, we are doing lots of things to uh, keep cars out of the not only the historical centre and the, the city centre of Brussels, we also have a low emission zone, we have mobility uh, plans to avoid transit uh, traffic through the, through the neighbourhoods, so slowly uh, we're getting there because we used to be a city that was really made to measure for, for cars. Uh, another thing that I wanted to show you is this picture, and it's all about uh, uh, planting trees. Um, it's, we, we have started, the, the presentation is chaotic, but also the underground of Brussels is quite chaotic. And as you know, and I don't have to explain why we need to plant a lot more trees, uh, but often the Brussels underground doesn't allow it because you have lots of utilities on, in the underground, uh, gas, sewers, telecom and all those things. So we started with uh, mapping the underground and the idea is that we'll do it neighbourhood by neighbourhood and that everywhere where it's possible to uh, plant big trees, where the, the underground allows it, that we should do it. So that, that's um, because we, we want to have trees like, like these ones, big ones, <laughs> and not only slow, uh, small ones, because the, the underground doesn't uh, allow their, their, their roots to, to grow. We've already also, uh, what you see here is, um, uh, open joint, uh, because we, we have a lot of those cobbled stones in Brussels and uh, before, <laughs> and it's really a, a, a change of mindset, the people who work for, for the city of Brussels, they were encouraged to always take all the weeds out. <laughs> and now we, 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 we try to change that mentality and to really, we've redone this square and we have done it on purpose to leave eno enough uh, space between the joints so that grass can grow. And that's very important because we need to be able to infiltrate uh, the water in the ground and make it possible to, uh, and that's uh, an important thing to do it on the spot and so that the water doesn't go to the sewers. That's important everywhere, but this is an example that even on historical um, squares, it's possible to make sure that the water infiltrates on the spot. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a change of mentality. <laughs> and it's so it's not weeds, we do it on purpose. <laughs> Uh, another thing that I wanted to show you is um, it's not on the on the spot, but it's it's not important. We are also um, uh, trying to develop a city when it comes to urban planning according to the uh, principle of the ten minute city. And I know it's not a new concept, and a lot of cities do it. It's based on what are essential uh, services that need to be available uh, in, uh, in in the neighborhood in the neighborhood. What is proximity? And we have really thought this through with the universities of Brussels because we really, it's a concept, it's something that is a bit fashionable to say we're a 10 minute city, but what does it actually mean? So the universities of Brussels, they really came up with what is an essential service, what is essential on a neighborhood level. And it can go, it's of course, uh, uh, schools and, and daycares, but also uh, green spaces, but they, they, they've made a whole list of it. And uh, we're um, putting, it in a sort, putting it in a sort of app, because they also thought through the concept of 10 minutes, what does it mean by, by foot, what does it mean by bike, we don't consider the car, that's out, out, out of our, it's not one of the concept, it's not based, the concept doesn't take uh, into account cars. And we also try to think about, uh, and I will come to that later on, 10 minutes by foot or by, by bike is not the same for everybody. And we're trying to do, and that's a bit this, we're trying to do a bit of gender planning in, in Brussels. So it's the 10 minutes means, uh, I think it's four kilometers and a bit more by foot. So we try to not build the city based on a fit, able-bodied man. We try to take into account all categories of other people that live in a city, and it's the same by bike. And so the whole idea is to, to really use this concept the, 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 to per neighborhoods, the, 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 the 60 essential services, or yeah, they, they call it services, but it's also green spaces or, or, or um, areas to play with uh, the concept of 10 minutes, but really like almost something where you can put data in and something comes out. And the idea is that it also, we, we put it available in open data so that all the, the inhabitants of Brussels can see what is missing in their neighborhood and what we as a city should add. So 
that's uh, something I really wanted to talk about. Um, another thing is that that, that thing indeed, um, maybe the, the gender planning. I'm, I'm a convinced uh, feminist and gender planning was something that we didn't do in Brussels at all. And we noticed that when we do, uh, and now we do, for example, when we um, start rethinking about uh, a street or a public square, we uh, do we count how the, the, the square is used. And we, we noticed that some squares um, are, during the day, they're used 90% by men or by boys. In the evening, it's almost 100%. And then when we are thinking about the, the, the changes that we have to make to that space, it's also with the idea of how can we attract more girls and more women? <laughs> and how can we make sure that they not only feel safe all the time, but also feel free in the city? And that's a different concept because safe is more passive and free is more active. <laughs> um, and it's and often when, pe when I talk about that, I get insulted on Twitter for being too woke. But I think it's an <laughs> important concept in our cities because um, when it comes to playing outside uh, in the category between nine and 12, uh, girls only 25% only of the girls play outside. And when it comes to when we see, for example, our uh, areas where sport areas outside, it's only 15% of the girls. So what do we have to do? Which changes do we have to make to, to change and put that more imbalance between girls and boys? And it's, for example, it's of course, it's lightning, but it's also uh, making sure that you have no blind walls. Uh, it's a use of materials. It's uh, not putting the, the sports infrastructure in the center of a square and making all the benches look at the, the, the men that are doing sports. So it's all those things that we are, it, it's, it's, it's the beginning of thinking about those things, but we hope to make quite some progress in, in, on that field for the, in the following years. And, um, before people will get all angry about it, when it's a city that's good for women and girls, it's good often for all other categories of people. So it's not about excluding other categories of people, but making a public space and urban planning inclusive. Um, what I also wanted to show uh, is, this is an example of participation, and this is an example of also doing uh, participation. Uh, but I've put it here, not as an example on what we're doing well, although we're trying very hard, but uh, as an uh, example of what we could do better, because we have invested enormously in participation the, the last years, and we try to do it with young people. We, 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 here they can make with Duplo and Lego their own, uh, their own, own, own ideal square. We've worked with different groups, with specialized people. We also have participatory budgets. We have neighborhood committees that are drawn by, by lot. We've tried all those things, and still, we only mainly attract uh, middle-class uh, people and that are already have a certain knowledge in urban planning that can read uh, maps and plans. And it's, we have too many people in Brussels who on a daily basis are trying to just survive. And when it comes to urban planning, we're not at all reaching those people. And I don't have the solution. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Making sure that they don't on a daily basis have to survive will probably be the best solution, but that's a bit more complicated. And it's, it's, um, it's quite frustrating because we do all those efforts. And then in the end, when a project is uh, concrete and is being realized, people say, we didn't know anything about it. And what are you doing and why are you not including us? And then we go, but we just, we made, we, we have uh, sent out so many flyers and we made articles and why are you not informed? And it's, it, the problem is that the people who are already vocal become more vocal and other groups aren't, are, we, uh, although we try so hard, are still not listened to. And the fact that it, that it has in a, in a city as Brussels, and we are a very multicultural city with a very diverse population is that we as a city invest a lot in public space and in collective infrastructure, but people see it as an instrument of gentrification because they, they, they keep on saying to us, you are doing this because you want to push us away out of our neighborhoods to make place for more wealthy, uh, wealthy groups of people. And I think um, if we manage to do the participation better, they could probably feel like we're doing this for them. And 
And I'm saying that because I feel it's a problem in a city like Brussels with a huge difference in, in annual income. And, um, and it's a challenge and I, we, we don't know the solutions, although we try very hard. And that there I come to my last picture. I don't, I, you probably all know this. This is a <laughs> Manneke piece. <laughs> And uh, it's a, a, a picture of a, of a souvenir shop, and um, we're trying very hard to find like other cities a balance between tourists and 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 other oh, the, the other people, and make sure that Brussels stays a city for the inhabitants and where it's affordable to live in every neighborhood. And uh, Brussels used to be quite a cheap capital, especially compared to London or Amsterdam or Paris. But these last 20 years, prices really uh, have gone up. And young people nowadays, if they want to buy an apartment or buy a house and they don't have a lot of family money, they can't. And um, we, as a city, have been investing a lot in public space. And in a way, I think the discussion of public space is quite easy. It's just taking space away from cars and investing in public transport and making more bike lanes. I'm not saying it's easy, but the, the solutions are clear and evident for everybody. When it comes to affordable living, it's much more complicated. And um, we as a city don't have all the, um, the means in hand to really make an actual change. We can, uh, we have done, we have, we've been uh, trying to um, fight illegal Airbnb. We've been trying to, uh, we have a very high tax on, on speculation on buildings that are uh, abandoned or neglected or empty, and that's, that's working. We have uh, uh, architects that help people who have a shop and the, the floors above the shops are, are, are empty. We, they, they, can, we, they get money and an architect to make sure that the, the, the floors above the shops are being used. Why is this a problem? Because in, in Brussels we have lots of very narrow houses and then the shops used to be, the shop owner used to live uh, above the shops and that's not the case anymore. So we're doing all those little things, but still the big battle of, of affordable living where you need to work with taxes and um, trying to have rent control and, and all those things. In Brussels, it's not on the city level, it's on the regional level and even on the national level. level and it's very hard to do because we, you never know which are the perverse effects of a, of a certain uh, measure. And I think for lots of our cities, this is going to be the big challenge for the, the, for the following years because our cities are getting more and more attractive because of all the efforts that we do. But how are we going to make sure that, uh, that the cities stay uh, affordable and livable for all people and not only the uh, elites? So that's uh, mainly what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Much. Thank you to Anne. We have two quick more uh, presentations. We're going to try and um, get through them uh, pretty speedily so that we have a time to open up this to all of you for the, the, for the conversation. And we're now going to head, first of all, if you've been sitting on any of these chairs, you've seen a, a good bit of propaganda has been placed on all of your chairs because the mayor of Vilnius uh, has already been in here kind of uh, dropping uh, his leaflets to, to show a, a simple way in which you can get ideas across about uh, good urbanism and planning. So I'd now like to welcome to the stage the mayor of, of Vilnius, Mayor, uh, mayor Shemishash. Thank you. <laughs> Hello again. You know, there's one secret with leadership and change management and politicians especially and city especially. When we were asked to say, you know, one good example and one challenging or bad example of failure, it never works. <laughs> you know, it never works this way. You know, when I go to the street and people say, how nice it's done, thank you, man, and so on, I'm always... I, I always looking to the things which do not work in this place. Um, I, I think that we could do it better, uh, even though somebody is praising. And when, if you would ask me about some failures, so the biggest failure is when no change was introduced. Because it's very, very rare when we start doing something and it's complete failure. It's very rare. Typically, it's not changing what is the biggest failure because it's also an, an option. And we tend to think that not changing is, 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 a, is an option to avoid decisions. No, no, it, it's decision. <laughs> it's decision not to act. So it's our urge to, to, to be proactive and to act. Then, you know, one, one more initial statement is that all of us, we know what is livable, nice, 
cause a convenient city. We talked with Anna, of course, first of all, it, it has to be not shelled by Russian bombs, of, of course, first thing. <laughs> but then to raise the quality to, to the top, we have very lively, vibrant streets, we had nice, have nice shops or services or have something in the ground floor. We have like very cozy yards, lots of greenery. We have a very clear distinction of what is public and what is private. You have possibility to let your children out to the yard and feel safe that they will not wander somewhere to the other part of the city. Uh, on the other hand, it's very close to get on the other side of the street to the shop and to talk to neighbors. I mean, Basically, we know all, all this, and we've seen many pictures about it. But what's the rationale be, be, be behind this? How, how, how does it work? How, how do we change this in order to achieve that? And in, in the course of history, we had different city plannings. We had Roman cities, which were like autocratic cities. And uh, Mr. Trump tried to copy Roman architecture. The last decree about architecture was about this. We had medieval cities with all of these shops on the ground floor and then the shop owner living on the, on, the, on the upper floors. We had modernistic design, this Bauhaus, which is complete disaster. Uh, we we could, could, could see this uh, kind of monofunctional, uh, theoretically monof monofunctional regions, theoretically multifunctional buildings, which never work. And it is a complete abuse of space, which is never used properly. And now we have tendency to go back somewhere, to reclaim our cities, to, to go back. How do we do it? We have two, I have two, two, two slides here. One is one particular district, which was non-existent three years ago. This is completely new thing, completely new thing. It was a brown field, abandoned, uh, abandoned factories, almost nothing on the street. I mean, it was not, not, not used. Here we have, okay, Quite, quite nice district, uh, livable, livable, people like it. It's quite a challenging also to, to, to tell people that, you know, the density in this area is much bigger than the density in this Bauhaus regions from the Soviet Union, where you complain that the density is too big. <laughs> but in this case, you choose to be there. Why? I'll come to this, back to this. And then there's one quite typical street, you know, Typical Central Eastern European, or not on the Central Eastern European street, very wide. Nobody knows what is where, and this is this is now like the change is, is in one and a half year. Uh, okay, it's a different angle. I do understand, but it's not a zero emission zone. There are cars there, and I, I will talk a little bit why I don't believe it, that zero emission zone is a recipe which will work for the whole city. It may work for the part of the city, but not for the whole city. But uh, the thing, how to change it, um, again, we have, to, we have to have certain certain things, like clear distinction between public and private, clear rules about ground floor, clear rules about greenery, clear rules about many, many other things. And here, the time comes for this propaganda on the chest. <laughs> It's very suitable to carry in, in, in a suit pocket, you know? And the, the first is the 12 principles of street design. It's, we have 300 pages long, uh, it's QR code leads to this. Uh, but, but these 12 principles, you know, why 12? Because there is a secret be, behind, behind change. You have to be ambitious and simple. <laughs> because typically when you do mistake, we either do not do any change, we do, lack ambition, or either we overcomplicate it. <laughs> when we overcomplicate it, it never works. <laughs> we have to be ambitious and simple. And this is about it. And these 12 principles are simple, but these are very ambitious, you know? To start designing from the greenery. If the tree is growing, first of all, do not cut it. <laughs> first of all, it was a big challenge for our architects because cleaning the field and then starting to to prepare a project and to build, that was typical, typical approach. Or that the driving lanes has to be wide enough, but not too wide. Or the turning angles not too big. Or that you know, have to be the line of shrubs, uh, the hedge alongside between the pedestrian lane and, 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 and the driving lane. 
between, not somewhere else, but between, in order to, to have it simple. That all elements have to be black in order to be, you know, black is classics, you know, it's not like 50 shades of gray as, as it's very typical, uh, typical in many, 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 many cities. It's, it, it's, it's clear that lighting has to be, first of all, for pedestrians and only then for drivers. I mean, so many mistakes everywhere in, 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 with this, uh, uh, not following this, this simple rule. So these are very simple rules. And again, it works because, because it's, it's simple. Another, another postcard is about 10 principles of architecture. I'm so proud, you know, because as with this one, I'm a mayor for seven and a half years. I was working for five years <laughs> to, to, to reach this simplicity <laughs> because before I had to ask my chief architect, uh, so is it a good project or bad? <laughs> okay, uh, this and that and that. So is it good or bad? <laughs> Now, it's very clear. Does it meet these 10 principles or not? And this principle is about sustainability, it's about ground floors, it's about all these simple things which we have to, to, to follow. The same about streets. Does it meet these 12 principles or not? And uh, this, this is simple. Now, now uh, I have like one minute or something uh, yet. Uh, why I don't believe in this zero emission zone so, 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 so much, you know, why, why I don't believe also in park and ride system as we tend to believe. This is basically a system invented in the United States for car-centric cities. Because park and ride means that first of all you think about the person who drives a car. How for him or her to leave a car conveniently? Why? I mean, it's, it's one more tool to spread the cities to suburban areas in order for them to use two modes of transportation but it's not for, for pedestrian-centered uh, city. The same for zero emission zones. If we in Vilnius, for example, have 2,000 kilometers of streets, if we would have like 200 kilometers of uh, zero emission zone, that would be biggest zero emission zone ever, but that would cover just 10% of the city, 10%. What about neighborhoods which also need good living environment? It has to be a combination. So one of the principles of, of the streets is we have parking alongside the streets. If you read just back about walkable city, he also says very, says very wisely that you know, cars parked alongside the street, it creates more, more security for pedestrians, it creates for business opportunities, so on and so on. So you have to be very careful about all, the, all these things, I think. Uh, also about cars, the car doesn't mean that it has to be a personal car. One, one postcard is about car sharing. We are number one in Europe for car sharing per capita. And this is a typical, typical uh, screen you see on your mobile phone when you want to pick up the car. There are many, many, many tiny details why it works in some cities and why it doesn't work in some cities. When I hear theoreticians talking about this, most of the time it's nonsense. I mean, I heard all this advice to the Vilnius-sized cities that it's too small for car sharing. You have to be bigger. No. It will never work so well in mega cities as in, in, in medium-sized to bigger cities because of many reasons. But you have to talk to those people who do business in this area. You, it's not allowed to create some kibbutz-style sharing. It's a kind of commercial activity which have to be met friendly. And, and, and this is our also memorandum agreement and hub, how we talk to those people, how we share cars. And it, very often, even European Commission and everybody misses the point about this. We have some other propaganda things on this. Please take a look. But again, in order to have a livable city, you have to be ambitious. You have to be simple. And uh, one more recipe, I think you have to avoid like typical solutions, even though they are very fashionable. And then looking back to like Prague, good examples, I really like this background, which was before, but you know, this Bauhaus tall building, which you don't show the ground floor because it's always awful, this ground floor. I mean, the same building will be the same awful with solar panels or without solar panels. The middle class families will want to run away from this building with good insulation or without. They will simply need a livable city, which was not the case during the modernistic era. Either it was Soviet modernistic era or it was Western European modernistic era. We have to, 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 to reclaim our cities back to make them livable and to combine everything. Basically returning back to the Middle Ages 
the medieval ages. It's quite, quite a wise solution. The question is how to do it in the 21st century. So thank you so much. Please use this if you have some questions. I'm very open to answer them and to discuss. Thank you so much. Thank you, Remigius. And, and finally, I mean, in a few moments, I'm going to quite say a few words about Monocle and, and our take on urbanism. But there's, there's one more presentation. We have uh, Philip Blasco Rocco, who's here from uh, Barcelona, who's uh, the head of international relations, the director of international relations for the city. And uh, he's kindly picked up the, the baton to kind of talk about what's happening in Barcelona. OK, thank you very much. I <laughs> Thank you. I really feel a little bit like a mouse after speak, uh, speaking after all the mayors and deputy mayors and how articulated they have been. And I'm the director, as uh, Andrew was saying, I'm the director of international relations and I can speak about multi-level governance or the relations of the cities with the UN. But when it comes to real projects, I need my notes. So I really I apologize for, for having to use my, my notes, but I need it. OK, OK, I start with, uh, with the challenge. Um, of course, everything is very challenging. It was very challenging from the beginning to find uh, pictures of, uh, of the Barcelona Energy Agency, which is the, the first project I would like to share with you. Um, it is the public uh, electricity trading company for Barcelona and its metropolitan area. Uh, our mayor thinks that important things should be in the hands of uh, in the public hands, always cooperating with the private sector. But in the case of energy, it is important that the city has its own um, uh, energy agency. Its mission is to contribute to the transition of the energy model by offering um, proximity and 100% of renewable energy. Its will is to have an active role in promoting efficiency and energy consumption and uh, enhancing the generation of local renewable energy by at the same time ensuring uh, electrical supply. Uh, the core values of this initiative are sustainability, proximity, transparency, and innovation. It offers the following services, the following five services, which is trading and supply electric energy, uh, representation of renewable producers in the electricity surplus market, also personalized assessment towards efficiency and, and saving of energy, and maintenance service of photovoltaic, photovoltaic installations, and finally, a total service for self-supply projects. We have now around 10,300 supply points and 180 generation plants, photovoltaic, uh, photovoltaic biogas, and PVE. And we are expecting an annual income of 56 million euros this year, 2022. It may sound as a, as, a, as a project of success, which it is up to a point, but this morning I was sharing with the, the rest of the mayors and deputy mayors that it is a big challenge what we have uh, in front of us. Uh, Barcelona is one of the sunny cities in Europe, but we only use 1% of solar energy. And I think it's between 8 and 9% of the energy we use comes from um, uh, renewable sources of energy. And we have the commitment to uh, the 5% uh, the reduction of carbon emissions by 2030. So if this is not a challenge, come and, and tell me. And that's why we have this initiative of the energy agency, but it really has to grow much faster and much bigger than we have. And here you have the, well, you have the panel, the solar panels, and um, the explanation of the metropolitan um, energy operator that we have in Barcelona and the logo of Barcelona Energia. So this is the challenge. And I'm gonna, disc I'm gonna speak now about what we consider a success in Barcelona. Uh, but I think later on we have, we'll have the, the chance to see that success, and as the deputy mayor, of, of Brussels was saying, success always comes with challenges and contradictions, because when you have success, you have gentrification, and then you have people who are expelled from their homes. But we are, we ha we are implementing this project of the Superblock, which is not different from the 10 minutes or the 50 minute city of Paris or the 10 minute city of, of Brussels. But in Barcelona, um, what we find is that we really need a new urban model. This new urban model 
uh, finds, first of all, the highest density of population in Europe, I think, or one of the highest density of population. We have 16,378 inhabitants for a uh, square kilometer in, in Barcelona. And we have the living conditions of proximity, and at the same time, and the possibility of having a polycentric city, too. Uh, this is the situation that we find, but we also find uh, a great deficit of green areas in Barcelona. And we, we see that this 50 percent of, uh, of our surface is uh, intended for motorized vehicles, which generates noise and pollution, of course. So the super blocks is the strategy to transform urban space across the city. It aims to change the spaces used by private vehicles into uh, those of citizens' use, but it goes beyond the rationalization of the current mobility. It seeks to reconfigure the functioning of the overall spaces across the whole city, and not only the city, but also the, the metropolitan area. It creates healthier, fairer, and safer spaces, favoring local social fabric and economic relations at the local level. Um, we are defining a new map of Barcelona. We're expecting to have one out of three of our streets being like this, being in a super block in the, the, in the, in the, for, in the forthcoming years. And um, it has been a co-creative project. Uh, we have had a lot of participation to define, which is not exempt from having problems and criticism. Uh, but it is true that it has been, uh, we have a platform called Decidim. I don't know whether you're familiar with this platform, but it has been known internationally. It's an open source platform for uh, participation of, of, of uh, people, of citizens, which has been used also by the, by the European Commission also at some points in some projects and also I think at the UN. So we have used this, this, this platform and it has been, um, the project has been approved by many people. But the important thing is not what you see in the picture, it's what you feel when you are in a super block. It's the feeling that you have proximity, the feeling that you are at home, the feeling that you can have interaction with your neighbors. And this is something that I cannot, I cannot show here. Um, it's, it's pretty much connected to what we call the right to the city. Uh, the general criteria governing this transformation is proximity and the right to, to public space, pub, the public use of space, the capacity to walk, to stay, to play. It is based upon a feminist vision also. It is um, um, a principle, its principle is to prioritize also children, the elderly, people with, with disabilities also, and the local services and local trade too. Um, it is an infrastructural vision of public space uh, with attention to water cycle, greenery, biodiversity, soil and energy. It's of course based on innovation and new materials. And it also has the value of permanence because it respects existing elements of the landscape of the city and the historical heritage. So I would like to discuss later on all the contradictions that even this successful project has brought to Barcelona, but I think it would be better to do it together with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Philippe, and we'll have you all back on the stage in a second, as well as uh, Jerry Voop, who's uh, here for, uh, representing Berlin as well. I'm going to, just going to rattle through a few slides about Monocle to explain a little bit. Uh, are you going to say some words after all, Jerry? Oh, no, if you have some words, I, you, I, I was told you didn't have any slides, but Jerry, please come up. Yeah, hello, I'm Gary Wurp. Um, I'm State Secretary um, in, at the Administration for Europe and Culture in Berlin. Apologize, please, uh, my insufficient English. Uh, try to translate and to understand uh, what you can. Um, I, I serve uh, at this administration and have the responsibility for um, uh, European uh, Union affairs, policy affairs, and for our uh, relationship to the churches and uh, religious uh, associations, and for listed monuments. That's why I, I could uh, debate uh, uh, or have a controversial debate uh, on, on the Bauhaus, because Berlin is a Bauhaus city, one of the three cities in, in Germany. 
And we have uh, an interesting debate on the traditions, uh, what does the Bauhaus uh, idea means and, and what are the deficit uh, what has been uh, the, the deficits uh, in uh, realizing that that idea um, but uh, when we uh, have this debate this this afternoon uh, I, I'm thankful because because of the invitation to this event and uh, for the possibility to exchange these ideas and experiences um, the, regarding the, the challenges we, we all face in, in the EU capitals um, in, in this time um, of, of this uh, mixture of crises we, we face. Um, when we, we sp uh, speak about uh, what uh, makes uh, a city um, uh, livable, so we can first ask, uh, uh, for for whom we make as politicians and administrations the, the city um, uh, livable. So I, I think that's uh, what we have to um, keep in mind. It's for all the citizens we have in our cities. So it's not only, uh, these are not only the, the or, um, original Berliners. So I, um, I live, I've been living in, in Berlin um, for, for uh, 30 years now, uh, but I'm not the original. So, and uh, Berlin was a city uh, the separated city during the Cold War, with the wall, you know, uh, this, this uh, pictures uh, from Berlin, and it has been uh, dramatically changed. But we have this micro migration periods uh, during the 60s and the 70s, coming from, from Turkey, from the, from the Kurdish part of, of uh, Turkey, in the 19s, from, from Russia or post-Soviet Union um, countries. And uh, then the refugee, refugees uh, from, from African um, states, and uh, in the last time, more than uh, 30,000 um, refugees um, in, in uh, 2015 and 16. So that's, uh, that are all um, citizens of Berlin with several or with, with different needs we have uh, to take into, into account. Um, it depends on, on their. Um, uh, on their uh, relation or on their uh, status in, in in which communities they are uh, they live um, in uh, which uh, cultural tradition they have which belief uh, they have and uh, it depends also from 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 the income uh, status so that's uh, what we have uh, to to address uh, with, with our policy uh, in 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 the city um, when we we speak um, about uh, the liability uh, of of uh, of a city uh, like berlin um, uh, I mean, it's similar to your cities. I, I, I know I know all uh, of, of them. Um, I, I have to, to look at, at Barcelona. Uh, <laughs> the, um, it's about um, housing. It's, um, that means uh, affordable housing. That's the, the, the main point. Also in Berlin, you can imagine uh, uh, that. And uh, it's about uh, education, uh, it's about uh, work, it's about culture. Um, and culture means uh, this, in, in this variety of from, from the opera to the club uh, and then the nightlife of Berlin. So it's, in, it's incredible. Um, and uh, it goes uh, further uh, to, uh, to uh, um, questions um, of less pollution, less, less noise in a city, uh, that makes a city um, livable, I would say. And, um, and the, the point I want to highlight is the transportation, uh, the pub, that means the public transportation, and uh, we, we could ask uh, what regards uh, to, to this. Um, I, I mean, um, the system is, is important. We have, similar to Prague, I would say, I, I'm, I'm proud about uh, part of the of the tra public transportation in Berlin because it's it's a mixture of of systems um, of underground of tram um, of buses uh, and uh, the, the the city trains and regional trains uh, that connected us with the suburbs of of, of Berlin in the, in the metropolitan area that's a, a very a, um, successful development during during the years um, the the question regards also to the intervals it's uh, nobody wants to to wait uh, more than 50 min five minutes uh, for for an uh, underground i would say so for a train so that's that's an, an, an point um, it's uh, regards to the connected areas we we have to 
to look on uh, all parts of, of the city. So it's clear we have an, an, a more connected system with, with uh, better intervals uh, in the inner city, in the center of Berlin, uh, than in the, in, in the uh, districts outside of the center. So, and that brings some troubling uh, debates with the citizens there, living there. They, they ask also for this quality of, of public transportation in, in the districts outside. Um, so uh, the, the next point I want to uh, um, refer is uh, the, uh, the question of, um, or the aspect of priority lanes. Uh, you know this, this structure of, of um, traffic uh, in, in uh, your cities, and it's similar to Berlin. There is um, all the day this traffic jam, and we have to, to change the, 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 the space for, for the, from, from, the, from the cars to, to the bicycles, to the pedestrians, and uh, to the public transportation. And we have to give the public transportation um, the priority because nobody wants to wait in a bus uh, in, in a traffic jam. So that's, that's the point, and it's a critical debate on that. Um, I mean, some, someone of you uh, mentioned that uh, this morning. Um, it's a hard debate uh, in a city of, of, of the uh, uh, population uh, on, on that, because the car drivers have a good lobby, um, lobbying also in the, in the political system of, of Berlin. Um, the public transportation regards also to the costs. So I would say it, uh, Berlin has a, is, has a very cheap uh, public transportation. Um, I am afraid uh, it's, it's not as cheap as in Prague, but it's, <laughs> but it's uh, in, in relation to, um, to other German cities and, and, and regions, it's really cheap. Um, we had this, this wonderful experience uh, this summer. And as the federal government uh, launched this nine euro ticket, nine euro per month for, for regional uh, expresses using all the public transportations in all cities, towns um, of Germany. So it was a an, 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 uh, very one good uh, experience, but it was an ex expensive experience. It was The idea was to, to um, reduce the burdens of the citizens in this time of increasing energy prices. So um, the, the, uh, the, the project um, uh, was launched for three months, so and now there is uh, the, pro the project is ended uh, at the end of, of August, and uh, the Berlin government decided we try to find a new solution uh, to to fill the gap until January, and so we launched a 29 euro uh, ticket per month for the the city of Berlin. So it's for only for for our city, not for the suburbs. So there are some some problems uh, with that, um, but we, we did it and, uh, and we hope that we will find an, a new solution uh, on the f from the federal um, uh, government for the, for the next year, beginning uh, in January next year. So that's We're going to have to wrap point. it up there because uh, we're yeah. trying to avoid too many big speeches. Yeah. We wanted to get this to be participatory and make sure that people get to ask yeah. some questions. So thank, thank you. you very much and we'll have you back on stage in two seconds. Thank you very much indeed for Berlin. <laughs> Okay, let's see if I can do this in the fastest presentation ever known to man, but here we go. Monocle, that's me, that's uh, why I'm here, so let's go. Uh, since uh, 2007, we've done a quality of life survey, ranking cities around the world, what makes them great places to live in. And the reason we did it was we thought there were so many surveys that focused on really boring things like the, only the quality of education, for example, private schools. Uh, they were all based really for expats traveling around the world. You're going to end up in every single little Swiss city. If you followed their advice, you'd be thinking Bern was the most exciting place to live on the world. Apologies to anybody who's rocked up today from Bern. Um, just one little thing. We, we all know this fact. Urbanists do it better. Here, this is one of the most important things. We're hearing about big plans, big schemes, but we talk about participatory. Sometimes cities just have to let go. And actually, it doesn't all have to come from City Hall. Just trust people, just give them the, the tools to make their cities better. They know what they need. They can fix things on their own. Open spaces, don't lock gates at night. Let people have access to public spaces. This was a, this was a, a project that we saw, um, we'll put it on back again. 
This was uh, a project that we, we were told about actually when we were here um, for an, uh, another urbanism conference a few years ago. This was in, um, in, in um, Budapest where they had some roadworks on the other side of the road. So they stopped people going across, across the road. And lo and behold, one night people thought, oh, we could climb over the barrier and can sit on the bridge because now there's no traffic. Suddenly people adopted it, took it. It cost nothing. It became the most popular piece of public realm in the whole city, and it hadn't cost a penny. And then the city got behind it, and the following year they closed the bridge to allow them to, allow them to do it. And just quickly, this is in, um, in Paris, a really beautiful scheme where the, the, the mayor, Anne Hidalgo, said, why don't you come and get some seeds and some soil and some pots from us, and if you want to go and plant some trees on the, on, on the street, we'll help you do it. You water them, you take care of them, but you know, it's up to you. You make the city a, a better place. Green space, we all know that the, the demand for green space has increased. We all know that during the pandemic, the connection to green space wasn't just about keeping physically fit. We have to think about cities making us mentally fit as well. And that, that's a, a big challenge. In, in the past, we've talked about sport and health. And sport here, it, it, again, is, is vital. But we also need to think about, um, about mental health when we think about our cities. And very quickly, this is a tiny project in France. It's just literally a gap in between two buildings. There was nothing there. They just painted the courtyard. They used bright colors. And it became a proper community meeting place. Again, some of the th things that have come up already, the, the use of materials, two quick things. This is a, a project in Turin. An office said, look, why don't we turn our roof into a vegetable garden? We'll grow the vegetables that we need for our salad at lunchtime. The staff go up there and work together to grow the food. It's been a beautiful project. Again, low cost, almost nothing. And the guy who has this office is an architect, and he's found a scheme to put beams across even buildings where you, everyone says, oh, no, you can't have a garden up there because the roof will collapse. He's found a way of making it possible. And why a plate? Because this is a project in Hackney in London where there's a beautiful circular economy project where the waste is taken from the coffee shop, is given to planting uh, new food, to making materials, all of these things going around in a, a wonderful, glorious circle. Retail. Yeah, it's great. We all order everything online, and a nice big box arrives at the door, and you don't have to go out. It's a disaster, because small shops owned by managers have people who are passionate, passionate makers of places. These people understand the community. Their eyes and ears on the road. They know, they know when something's up. They know when a neighbor has been missing for a few days. These are the people that matter. All wonderful little projects here. Um, three of them are actually in Berlin, so congratulations to Berlin. And uh, one of them is uh, in Portugal as well. A bit too much Nordic here, I'm afraid. But anyway, th there you go. It's a, a little bit of too much Copenhagen. But we know that cycling is important, but it's not just enough making a cycle lane or, making, or telling people to walk. It's about providing the right signing, the way, right wayfinding. That gets people going and encouraging people to move about. And also, I just think beauty. You know, we, we forget it should be beautiful. You know, this is a, a tiny project in London here at the end where they had these 1960s walkways between buildings that were disgusting and you know, people went up there to have a pee at night and things like that. So nobody ever went on them. They weren't well lit. They weren't safe. They're magical now that people want to walk between, between the buildings just because Somebody added beauty. So we're talking about some tough things here today. But serendipity, beauty, good design are also key. The nighttime economy, vibrancy, we, we heard here from Berlin. Berlin did amazing things to keep the nighttime economy going. And again, why is the nighttime economy important? Apart from being able to go and let off some steam at 3 o'clock in the morning, Actually, the, the nighttime economy is often the first access point for people who arrive in your city. So they, they, they may not speak the local language, they may not have all the skills yet, they're training to do something else. And the nighttime economy is a glorious thing because it welcomes people into the city. Finally, you'll never guess all of these images were taken just uh, a few weeks ago, and they're all in Ukraine. So these are, these are amazing examples of how even now, in the midst of everything that's going on, of all the stories we've been told over the last couple of days, how if you give people a break, if you allow peace to return for a few minutes, how quickly 
the issue of quality of life becomes important to people. So um, rapidly, this is, uh, this is uh, Kiev here. This is uh, Chernikiv, where you know, everyone wants a bike share scheme. But when your public transport has been bombed and destroyed, this guy set up a little bike share scheme. So he realized that mobility could be fun and beautiful, even in a bombed city. And then quickly down here, this is, uh, this is a morning jog in Kyiv. Just again, just a few weeks ago, uh, they were apparently stopping <laughs> guys on the other side of the bridge to make sure that they shouldn't be signed up for the army, but that's a, another story. Uh, but unbelievably, this is Butcher. This is Butcher where the massacre happened. And as soon as the Russians were gone, as soon as the people had their city back, what were their priorities? Their priorities were, of course, food and, and warmth and insulation and, and protecting their homes. But also, people have to live. And even in these tough, tough places, somewhere like Butcher, suddenly people were back on the boardwalk, back out enjoying their city. Cities are amazing places that are embracing uh, and good for us. And these examples show that even in the midst of you know, the darkness that we've heard about over the last few days, you can have extraordinary examples of simple pieces of urbanism making people's lives better. So that's Monocle's take very rapidly on the world of urbanism. Now we're going to bring some chairs up, and I think all of our panel are going to come back up. So I, if you haven't got questions after that, so don't forget, you can go to um, slide.com, and if you just type in uh, hashtag summit of the cities, then you'll be able to ask some questions. So we'll wait for the chairs to come up. I think they're nearby. Well, a, a, an amazing uh, set of presentations this afternoon. L let's start uh, in Helsinki after you've, you've had your glass of water. F fresh water is a, a key thing for the world, the world of Helsinki, as we know. Just tell us quickly, you know, we, we, we've heard about the, let's do the tough question, we've heard about the world of energy crisis, you, you've shown us a power plant that's being closed down. Is there any hesitation in your city or people saying, actually, maybe we should keep that power plant open for the moment because in, in this rush to be re renewable and to be a more sustainable uh, city, is this the right moment to be shutting down a power plant? Has that debate happened in your city? Or is, there, or is everybody on board with the, the goals of being neutral, climate neutral, um, um, CO2 neutral by 2030? Thank you. I would perhaps be happy to say that no hesitation whatsoever, but it wouldn't be true. I would say that regarding that power plant that I showed to you, that is fairly clear the investment is being done to replace it. But otherwise, the current situation has put um, the heat production in, in turbulence and we are having uh, tough debates as well. Uh, we had been planning to have uh, natural gas that in our case uh, was all the time Russian natural gas to be the phase-out period uh, from coal to completely uh, biomass and even sort of uh, non-burning uh, alternatives. Now that we don't have the gas, last winter actually, when the gas price was already such that we couldn't use it, um, we were just burning crude oil to heat the city in the coldest days. So. Yes, there's debate and uh, hesitation at the moment. I think what has made things more clear is the European emission trade prices that clearly show out part of the alternatives. Um, also, I think that although we own our own energy company 100%, uh, a company that works in the market, it's interesting that there's a really tough debate between the city as an owner and the company, although you would ima could imagine that it would be an easy one, but it isn't. And then there's also political debate, as we discussed with um, uh, Mr. Timmermans also in the morning, that there are forces that are trying to use this situation with energy prices 
to blame it completely on climate, although it's clear, I think, here for everyone, uh, that it's the war that uh, put things in such turbulence that we are in now. Uh, just tell me a practical thing. You said that you know, this winter you will be closing <laughs> some sports halls because it just won't be possible to heat them, and you'll be turning down the dial in, in public buildings to make them not as warm as they were maybe last winter or the winter before. Well, just tell us... Uh, how much energy does that save? And how, how much are you turning the dial down in chilly Helsinki this winter? Um, we're actually in the process of counting it. Um, it seems that we are perhaps aiming in the direct savings to somewhere between 10 and 15% uh, of really savings. And um, with the temperatures, we had a debate and I think when we, at the city board, we formulated the um, sort of initial action for lowering the temperatures, we also had phrasing uh, so that no one would additionally suffer or something like that. So uh, it's a detailed work where you have to see if it's elderly people, they sort of freeze more easily. And also there's some tolerance that if people start complaining, then perhaps we balance with it. But it's also, I think, that in, in Helsinki and in Finland, we tend to keep the inside temperatures fairly high. So I think that there's also really room for lowering the temperatures. And regarding sports facilities, there are many sports facilities that use enormous amounts of energy. And that is also a debate. Some people say that we shouldn't close down anything. I'm myself of view that if the price on electricity is something really, really high, that the price is to keep up, say, we have had like a underground skiing facility where there's artificial snow for mega skiers, and it might be that in Helsinki you don't have natural snow almost at all. So I just think that there's no point of really using energy in such occasions. But of course, we then prioritize, for example, school children's uh, sport facilities and try to see that if we close down something, it's for adults more. Philippe, let, let's come to you and just stay on this notion of how you bring people along on the conversation and, and make it participatory. The, 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 the presentation you gave with the superblocks, the superblocks are, are an amazing thing, clearly. But I know that in Barcelona, that lots of people are not always on board with them when they're announced because they fear a very simple thing. They fear that there'll be gentrification and they'll be pushed out of their, their old neighborhoods. Is this a, a balancing act? You said there are some contradictions. With, with, with successes come some complications. Is this one of them for you in Barcelona? Yeah, definitely. It is, of course, what, when you improve one part of the city, of course, the, the prices go Get, there's a search of the prices of the, of not only of the of the housing but also of the um, of the prices of the, the the small commerce, which is key for Barcelona and I think for most of our cities to keep a social fabric um, local and attractive, even for tourism. I think that local go, local commerce should be protected. So yes, we have this contradiction, and I think the the idea is to have. Um, and I think I'm sure here at camp are thinking about this kind of stuff as we are doing as we are doing in Barcelona with the Barcelona Regional, which is an organization which is similar to camp. When and then you have to think about your city holistically and not only about the projects to improve one part of the city, but to see the consequences of what happens when you improve one part of the city in the other parts of the city. And not only the other parts of the city, but also the metropolitan area where you are living. And also the, the, the dialogue between the, this urban area and the rural, rural area. Today we were discussing the problems also of populism in the rural areas. If, <coughs> excuse me. If we had a better dialogue between cities, urban areas, and rural areas, I think this problem. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. He's very emotional about Barcelona. It's such a beautiful city. It's uh, it chokes you up. When I talk about metropolitan areas, I always get very emotional. You know. <laughs> Wait till we get you on gas prices, and then you'll be crying. <laughs> so, so the idea is yes, we have contradictions, and the contradictions should be fought 
with holistic visions, not only uh, doing small things in little parts of the city. Jerry, one of the things is that this, this, this brings to the fore is this question which we've been hearing about, you know, the role of the, the car in the city. We know that it's a, it's a, uh, it's a question in, in, in many election campaigns as cities try to move to um, other forms of transport. But for Berlin, there, there, there is a push, there has been a push to be a car-free city. But your mayor has recently said, look, you know, we, we need to go at a, a, a more even pace because it, it, there are neighborhoods where people are, are getting, uh, who, who should be on board are, le are less excited about these projects than they, they were in the past. What's the, the, the balance, again, this tension that you find where you push forward in one direction and then it, it throws up some issues elsewhere? Um. We, we try to make the, the, the public transportation at, at first uh, more attractive, uh, but uh, the, the standards uh, belong to the that belongs to the uh, that regards to the standards uh, within. You, you feel better in a modern um, uh, uh, transportation uh, system, and and this, the second thing is uh, to to reduce the costs for that. That makes it more attractive to use it. Uh, and then uh, there is uh, this this uh, point of, of uh, priority lines that, that, that means uh, programming the, the trams uh, that they can go forward uh, in the traffic jam or the buses can use their own lanes. So, and that makes it unattractive to use the car. So and that's, uh, that brings tensions and critics, uh, critics uh, uh, against the, the government. Um, and um, the, the, cr the critics say, yeah, you think only on, on the cyclists and, uh, and not uh, uh, for, the, for the car drivers. But it's what we do, and we have to persist, uh, this, this critics. And we, we are um, convinced that it's the, the, the right way to reduce this space uh, for cars and to, to change the, the city. Um, also make it greener and uh, more more uh, resistant against strong rain or and against the hot summers. So and uh, and to use the space for for public uh, um, things and and uh, interests and for the public transportation. So, but it's uh, not easy to to say there are contradictions and uh, there is a tensionable situation. Remigius, you've already hinted that the, you, know, you you have some questions about the pace of change and how we deliver change as well. Because one of the interesting things is, is when you often talk to people in cities, that they say, look, we all understand that everybody should be on a bicycle, but the reality is not everybody can get on a bicycle. And in some cities, the, the weather isn't always uh, compliant when you want to encourage people to get onto bicycles. And there's also another question, you know, that we say everybody should have an electric car, but the, the truth is that electric cars cost more at this time than than, than fuel cars, and saying to somebody who's doing a night shift who has to get up and travel out of town to a, a factory at, you know, at midnight, that you need to be buying an electric car or you should be going on a bicycle, it, it seems tough. So how do you bring all these various different competing people along in the conversation that you have in Vilnius? Of course it's difficult. And actually, it's a pity that, that the Vice Mayor of, uh, of uh, Brussels left. I wanted to, to, to say that it's very honest for her to say that, you know, that it's just middle class people are getting to all these discussions. For us, again, we just discussed a little bit uh, by sitting together, that at least for Vilnius, during pandemic, when we switched to Zoom and, 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 and Teams and other platforms in discussing public projects, I am happy that at last we were able to reach middle class people to have on these discussions because before it was everybody except middle class people. <laughs> because typically angry people were coming for discussions and of course discussion was ruined immediately because people who are patient, who are polite, they tried to avoid discussions because they are simply offended, nobody listened to them and so on. So yes, this, by discussing and it's always painful and it always causes uh, lots of issues, but speaking about the speed, I don't subscribe it that we have to be slow. I think we have to be very fast if it's a good thing. If it's a bad thing, let, let, let's not do it at all. <laughs> I mean, and for the car-free zones, I mean, if a car-free zone is a good thing, let's do it immediately. I mean, we don't bring car in everywhere, and that, that's it. 
I mean, if it's such a good thing for all the city, if it will solve all the problems, zero emissions or car-free zone, let's do it for the city. But we do understand intuitively that we will need cars. I mean, if you don't have your personal cars, sometimes you need a taxi, sometimes you need delivery, sometimes you need something else. Maybe electric car is better, but it takes the same amount of space as the, the diesel car as well. So it's maybe, maybe better for climate, maybe not so better in having in mind all the cycle and everything, but it takes the, the same amount of space. So I think it's more about space more about using our space and then having this debate. And in, in some areas, of course, we have just have to get rid of, of cars in some, 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 some areas, no. And we have to be very precise about the things because there are lots of ideology about it. And I think we have to be to look from, from a human perspective. Again, this constant that people tend to go for everyday commuting uh, for no longer than half an hour. Okay, what does it mean? I mean, pedestrian, half an hour means one certain amount of kilometers, bicycle, public transport, how we combine it. We don't want to close cities to one neighborhood and other neighborhoods not commuting with, between each other, and public transport solves most of the issues, but not all of the issues. So all these things has, have to be answered. So it's not about speed, but about finding the right, the right answer. Again, there was, as I was telling, if we close 10% of streets, what happens with the next, uh, other 90%? And then tend to focus on 90% instead of 10%. 10% is nice, but this is nice to show a picture. But this is not where people live. Again, one, one more example, uh, what I'm afraid of and what they see in other cities when they examine uh, those car-free zones, most often it works very well, but very often these are the same cities which are complaining then that there are no inhabitants in these areas and it's uh, Airbnb zones over there. But for me it's a question, you know, if it's middle class family living in this central part, if we make it complicated for the family to have a car in order to go for like weekend shopping or to the nature or somewhere to the grandparents or whatever, at least once a week, I know exactly because we do surveys that sometimes these people choose to leave the central city and to go to suburban area. So we have car-free and resi residence-free <laughs> central, central part. So I think we have to be very careful. And I know Ljubljana is doing a lot of these things, and they are calculating very well. Again, it, it corresponds to the size, to everything, and I think they're doing very, very well. But it's so easy to make mistakes <laughs> that you, you, have, you have just to calculate, not, not to slow down, but to calculate. Uni, we're going to take a question from the, from the that's been sent in, in here, which is, uh, Helsinki is one of the 100 carbon neutral cities by 2030. What are the major issue? What are the major plans plans to achieve this goal in that short time? And it was interesting this morning. You you, you showed a, a graph which was a, 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 it was a downward slope in, in emissions, but I wasn't quite sure that it was a, a steep enough slope down for you actually to hit that target. Do you think you're going to hit the target? I think we will hit the target, but it will require not easy decisions from us probably like every year <laughs> till 2030. Uh, of course, when we get rid of coal, it will give us like, now we have been going slowly down, but that will give us like a leap or like um, 15 to 20 percentage points of uh, uh, down in the emissions. Uh, I could describe that uh, this autumn, we have been analyzing the gap between the existing plans in traffic emissions and the actual goal. And I would say that that will be a really difficult discussion because uh, transport, is, it touches people personally. We have been really uh, sort of th thoroughly and systematically working with uh, energy efficiency of the buildings, with the buildings we own as um, public rental housing, that we do it energy efficient. And no one complains, and you can do the decisions fairly easily, or that we have requirements for newly built buildings that, okay, they have to be more energy efficient uh, than the national um, requirements. And it might be that construction companies or develop developers complain a bit but they are few and they anyway want to build in Helsinki. So in the end, they don't complain. But when we get to the discussion that actually we should reduce the driven kilometers within the city 
we will have a difficult uh, discussion. Our method that we have chosen, we bit imitated Oslo, um, not what they did originally with the um, carbon budgeting, mm -hmm. but a uh, bit how they changed it. That our idea is that we bring every autumn within the budget to the budget proposal book, we bring the new measures for reducing emissions. So that keeps us in a rhythm that we don't like think of all the measures in the beginning of council period, that is four years, but that actually we have this sort of uh, rhythm that every year we analyze and think that, okay, these are the four or five most important next measures, new measures. And I think that is a good way of working, that you don't get stuck into one debate, but that you constantly produce uh, the new approaches. Remigius, there's a question here for you, which is about the, the, the Soviet functionalist architecture. I think there's so many books now, you can probably buy two or three of them here in the bookshop here, that kind of celebrate the glories of, of concrete, br brutalist architecture around the world but doesn't really take into account often the, the people who still live in some of these places and have got some, some ideas to share. You, you've, you did say to me earlier today, actually, when, when people talk about reuse and repurpose, that actually there is occasion for another option, which is bulldoze as well. So maybe you could explain to us your take on what needs to be done. You know, uh, one of these 10 principles of our architecture is about reusing. So we urge reusing wherever it's possible and also reusing uh, all this uh, functional five uh, stores, uh, block houses, also uh, I think it's a, it's a good idea in general. Of course, uh, there is a time limit for all the constructions and uh, there will be time when they have to be teared down because of, uh, they, they were worn down because of many, many, many reasons. Uh, you don't have to, to tear down buildings until it's necessary and uh, I feel a little bit jealous also to Helsinki when you close this factory, what a kind of thing you will have for reusing for different purposes. So don't tear it down. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, just, just an amazing. So for industrial heritage, also from Soviet time, it works very well. For residential heritage, it's a little bit more complicated. But what actual discussions what we have, it's actually we have this, not just houses, but urbanism, Soviet urbanism and functional urbanism, which is, which is worse than houses. And then you have this kind of houses, which is not a perimeter like by the street, but it's like east-west orientation, which has no direction to the street in general, and no yards and no nothing. And suddenly a new developer comes and says, you know, I will build some few more houses in this, in this part, and I will all have the same orientation as before, because it's kind of context, we will fit into the context. So of course, our response is that you have to fit into the context and to respect context. That's again one of the principles, but the desired context. And sometimes the context which is existent is not the desired context. So what, what we say that you know in some of these areas, maybe in 30 or maybe in 50 years, those houses will be teared down. And when your houses will be there in the neighborhood, so these houses, which will be built in 50 years, so do they have to adjust to your context, which you built today? So what kind of context it will be? So this is, I think, more complicated and not so much about single house, but about urban structure. And we, have, we are developing right now, and that's one of the biggest tasks, how to create better context and yards and street life and everything out of this functional uh, urban urban structure. This is the real challenge, but the, uh, I didn't bring my, my slides for this, <laughs> but this is, the, this is the most interesting part, I must say. <laughs> uh, Philip, earlier today we heard that uh, for our cities to kind of cope with the energy crisis and to change and to be truly sustainable, we need to think about what's happening on our rooftops. We saw you know, a good example of growing food in our rooftops, but when it comes to solar panels, that was quite a shocking figure from you that only 1% of uh, energy in Barcelona is produced by solar panels. Um, Remigius was telling me that it's going to be tricky up in Vilnius because in the winter, in, and when the, the days are short and the, the, the sun doesn't come out, you, you just can't generate that kind of electricity. But you have big sunny days in the winter as well. Why has the adoption been so slow, do you think? The truth is that I, I don't have an idea, a clear idea of why it's been so slow, but I think that other sources were already, were not so expensive, so it was easier to keep on going, you know, to, to follow the, what we have been doing for years, and that's why 
I think there was not so much investment because it is expensive. It is expensive to put solar panels. And it's true also that it's one solution, but it's not the only solution because it also causes carbon emission, not the, 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 the fabrication of the, of the solar panels. So I think it has to be a system which has to be balanced. But of course, we have a lot of room to grow in, in solar energy in, in Barcelona. But we were saying this morning too that we need new technology. I think one of the mayors was asking the, the, the commissioner, the European commissioner to invest in, in uh, technology to improve uh, solar energy or solar engines to, to, to take advantage of, of solar energy. So I think it's something that it really has to, it, it, Barcelona really has to do an investment on this. There was a suggestion there is the kind of technology now that you could have tiles on the sides of historic buildings that nobody would guess they were actually solar panels. You could build the solar panels into windows. Again, so one of the challenges that came out, especially for an amazing city like Prague, when you have so many historical buildings in the center and you don't want to cover them with all of these panels, is there a way of like integrating them in a more interesting way? Remigius, so are you going to tell me off for saying it's not sunny in Vilnius yeah, yeah, yeah. in winter? It's, it's, I mean, you, you, as you mentioned this, you know, I have to explain a little bit more because I'm questioning all the time uh, things which I think is necessary to question. But it's very clear, if you produce anything in society, you have produced the thing which is needed by people on the time, uh, in the place where it's needed. So that's, that's the rule in the market. If you produce another thing which is needed, you don't deliver on time, or to the place we need it, it's a, it's a fiasco. And then, of course, in, in Southern Europe, when you have the huge energy amount needed for, for, for cooling, of course, solar energy is such a beautiful decentralized decision that you need it when it's produced. And uh, in Helsinki or even in Vilnius, well, we need definitely more energy during wintertime than during summertime. It's a little bit tricky. And of course, solar energy may solve lots of issues. But again, uh, I mean, if you produce this solar energy in Helsinki in summertime where the need is much lower, I mean, you have to have storage and storage costs and so on and so on and so on and so on. So you have to, again, very precise because we have very big production of solar energy in, in the Vilnius and Lithuania and wind energy. But again, there is a clear roof for this. I mean, you, we have to adjust consumption and production. Okay, sorry for interrupting that. I have to explain. <laughs> no, you, you're, you're right to explain. Do you want to just say... Uh, no, I just wanted to add that actually um, in Finland where the... Uh, quite late to the autumn, the um, evenings are quite filled with light, so uh, it's not such a bad place to produce uh, solar energy, uh, and I think that we are not yet in the numbers where we would have excess of it uh, in uh, wrong time of the year or wrong time of the day. And partly I think that the electrification of the uh, vehicles will also solve part of the storage uh, question because uh, those batteries will uh, serve as storages, but um, historic buildings and solar panels, definitely a question in Helsinki as well. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry uh, sorry, just two questions that have popped up here for you, which is, but it says Berlin has an excellent public transport system, but the annual ticket price is actually double that of in Vienna. Why? And also it says, you know, that while I love traveling on the S-Bahn around Berlin, there is an issue about um, safety when you get to stations that for many women traveling through those stations, for example, there's a, a sense that they're not quite safe to use at night. And as you encourage people to use public transport, we have to think about this as a, a 24 hour solution. Do you think that there are still some questions and some work for you to do there in Berlin to make it, 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 it you feel safe if you're a single person getting on, a, on the S-Bahn at night? Um. Of course, uh, everything, um, every good thing uh, you could make better, and, and that's, that's the same thing with, with the public transportation. Of course, we, we can make this this good system better, and that means also um, more, more personnel on, on the stations. Uh, you remember on this so-called political, so-called neoliberal times, uh, we, we reduced uh, the personnel on, on every station. There is nobody. So and uh, now we have this service uh, personnel, 
uh, moving with the trains, but not with every train. And uh, again, there is nobody um, of personnel um, at the station. So that's, that are um, points we have to, to elaborate, to discuss, and to improve that the passengers can feel um, safer than, than they do it uh, now. So of course, that's, that's the question. We're almost out of time, but Philippe, uh, saying, saying first of all, you were, you were shy and you had nothing to say. Now you, you want to dive back in again. Go for it, Philippe. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to talk. Uh, and very shortly, no, because I remember that like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there was an initiative of the Socialist Party to improve and to boost the renewable energy in, in Spain. And there was a lot of pressure from companies, from gas companies, to stop this. And it didn't evolve with the, um, with the other governments. And I think there's an, a political explanation on why we have not developed so far as much as we could, our renewables and the, the solar energy. So I wanted to share with this. Well, I'm afraid... Politics are always there. <laughs> okay. I'm afraid it's gone very, very fast, and we, we are out of time for this panel. Uh, a huge thank you to a, a, an amazing group of civic leaders and mayors with big ambitions. I'm only sorry that uh, Anne's uh, couldn't be here, especially because she was telling us how, why it's important to stick around and take questions from your constituents, and then she's not, it's not even here. So anyway, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll email the questions because there's plenty on here for Anne's as well. But to all of this amazing panel, thank you so much for joining us here in Prague. Thanks you. And just before they disappear from the stage, I think we can say thank you. So thank you to everybody who came. Uh, thank you to the, the Mayor of Prague for being such an amazing host over the, the last couple of days. Uh, lots of conversations started here that I, I'm sure will continue online over a glass of wine later on, hopefully, as well. That's certainly where, where I'm aiming for. Um, but I just want to say it's been an absolute privilege to be representing Monocle here in Prague. It's an amazing city with uh, so many interesting things going on. And just to walk around the city and see the kinds of projects that are up and running has been really stupendous. So a huge thank you from Monocle, from all of the people who have appeared on stage, and uh, a big thank you again to Prague. But perhaps we should just finally say, uh, Ukraine remains in all of our minds and hearts as we, we wrap up uh, a really important two days of discussions about the future of the city and why we want quality of life to return to every city that we know and love around Europe. So thank you.